They say only a select few ever repeat. It takes a great deal of physical and mental strength to overcome adversity. Whether you're chasing a ghost of the past or creating your own legacy, one thing is for sure, running it back two more times is never an easy feat. On the big screen, a trilogy is often considered the pinnacle of a story, oftentimes giving fans of a series so much the closure or a final climax that was being built to. More often than less, that third time around typically doesn't live up to that same hype the original does. Distinctively, a sequel can build upon the very idea a development team had initially, now able to act upon, executing that idea much more thoroughly with experience, delivering something remarkable that would be envisioned from the very start. Oftentimes, it can deviate so far away from that original idea, we oftentimes feel as if we are witnessing something entirely different than the creator is. In the case of Sonic 3, this 3 Pete lives up to the hype. Throughout history, many 3s in a series tend to carry this stigma about them. They tend to bite off more than they can chew, and Sonic 3 is by no means impervious to this. So with that said, how exactly did we get here? It's the summer of 94. I would be treated to what I assumed was the third and final act of one of the greatest trilogies of my early adolescence. If my memory serves me correctly, the very first time I came across Sonic 3 was at a buddy's house. I vaguely remember being dropped off for a short stay and trying out the versus rounds with him. You're probably thinking, why didn't you boys just play the story mode and someone man up and play as Tails? I'll be honest with you, I would be a team player at times, but believe me, no one wanted to be the sidekick in a Sonic game, especially when you know damn well you are getting smoked and you won't even be able to catch up unless your buddy needs an assist later on. I didn't get a ton of playtime in, but from the level designs throughout, these stages were special and I knew I was in for something big. I would go on to secure a copy later that year and was puzzled by this mysterious new character shown on the box. All I had to go off of was his piercing white eyes. I said to myself then, I was introduced to Tails in the last story as Sonic's partner in crime, but this here now, with eyes coming from the shadows, deep inside this new uncharted terrain, I had a hunch we weren't making a new friend anytime soon. Well, it wouldn't take long for me to get my answers, as I would quickly get home and tear that cheap plastic wrap off a freshly new Genesis clamshell. Inside housed, announced to me, a grail so grand in scale, it's considered today one of, if not the greatest Sonic game of all time. This was that once in a lifetime boyhood experience you get when you know from the start you're holding something unique compared to all others. A thousand thoughts rushed through my mind and the only question out of them I needed to find out then and now was if the hype was real. In order to find that out, let's now go back. After the massive success that was Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the Sega Technical Institute would suddenly split into two unique teams. The first primarily comprised of the core Japanese developers who would now go on to work on Sonic 3, while the others being the American team now tasked with working on the new Sonic Spinball. Yuji Naka and Hirokazu Yashihara would lead this new team in their greatest assignment to date, Naka serving as producer and Yashihara as director respectively. Naka would hand select the vast majority of the Sonic 3 team, and Sega Japan sparringly would send additional employees over to the STI team. One recruit in particular, Takahashi Izuka, would be an integral player for Sonic Team going forward. Roger Hector was tasked with overseeing development, and with the plans now in motion, the project would roughly roll out around the beginning of January 93. Sonic 3's early development was designed around the newly engineered Sega Virtual Processor chip. What is this, you ask? Well, it's sort of Sega's answer to the Super FX chip. The virtual processor enabled the Genesis to render polygons in real time, providing an access transformation unit, which handles scaling and rotation. The only time it was truly capitalized on would be on Sega's virtual racing, and I must say, this cartridge is a hefty boy. It definitely stands out on any shelf with the rest of your Genie titles. The team would adopt this enhancement chip early on and created an early prototype build titled Sonic 3D, utilizing those sweet isometric capabilities we love from the late 90s. When the news broke that this chip would not be finished by the 94 deadline, the team changed course, opting for a more traditional 2D experience. We would still get a small glimpse into what could have been with Sonic 3D, as the team took these early concepts and adopted them into the infamous Blue Spheres minigame. We would still see many of these early ideas resurface later in Sonic 3D Blast. Expanding on the lighthearted story that was Sonic 2, Naka wanted something much deeper and expanded upon. He would achieve this in a variety of ways. Our story would now be told with beautiful visuals throughout, implementing in in-game cutscenes across the many new zones while also transitioning between acts. Visual cues and a far greater musical score would be added in to differentiate the acts, and work quickly began to add up. The levels themselves would soon triple the size of those of its predecessor. Those tiny eyes that pierce back at you from the box art? Well, that would become none other than Knuckles the Echidna, 
soon-to-be rival of Sonic the Hedgehog. Takashi Yudo will go on to be credited for this concept, going all in on our echidna. He was originally to be known as Dreads for sporting those luscious locks, yet Pamela Kelly would be the one to come up with the name Knuckles, which just instantly stuck with him. The name symbolizes his raw power in comparison to Sonic's unmatched speed. His sheer strength would allow him to break through walls, soar his way past badniks, and scale his environment, which allowed for some creative new takes on the level designs and exploration. It's no secret today that Sonic 3 is one of the greatest yet controversial games of an era, especially when it comes to the musical composition. This in large part due to the involvement of MJ, who was and still is today regarded as the true king of pop, and the guy absolutely loves Sonic the Hedgehog. As early as 1990, Jackson would collaborate with Sega on the 1990 arcade hit Moonwalker, Yet regardless of his contributions, for years his work on Sonic 3 would go uncredited, being denied by senior Sega management. The evidence, however, was there. Naka straight up saying it years back when Origins dropped. I guess the NDA expired, folks. The development team, including Naka, would visit Jackson early on, recruiting him at his Neverland Ranch. Oshima would note that Jackson recorded an acapella demo tape as well for Sonic 3. However, Jackson's involvement would ultimately be terminated following incriminating allegations that arose around this time. Unfortunately today, if you decide to purchase Sonic 3 on a collection like the Origins collection, Jackson's tracks are nowhere to be found, swapping them out with the PC versions that were initially part of the original prototype build. I guess I'm putting on the My Jenny copy of Sonic 3 for the foreseeable future. After Sonic put an end to Eggman's latest schemes across West Island, his Death Egg begins to crash down high above the skies on a collision course with a mysterious floating island. This island is known to the natives of the land as Angel Island, which manages to stay afloat due to its primary power source the Master Emerald. For many years, the island remained safely suspended above the clouds due to a chosen guardian known as Knuckles the Echidna. Surveillancing his land from his island's altar, his duty, much like Sonic's, is to protect the island and its inhabitants at all costs. As the Death Egg slowly comes in contact with Angel Island, the impact causes a wave of destruction, forcing the island to change course down into the ocean below. Surviving the crash, Dr. Eggman comes to and finds himself on Angel Island which is now floating across the Mobius Sea. Soon after, he discovers a powerful energy signal that leads him directly to the island's power source, the Master Emerald. Realizing the potential of this newly found power source, Eggman constructs a plan to extract its power to resurrect his Death Egg and continues his plans for world domination. Thus he sets out constructing a launch base and roboticizing the local inhabitants into his favorite badnik variety, rebuilding the island to his liking through his own evil genius intent. As he pursues this newly discovered Master Emerald, he comes face to face with the island's guardian himself. Using the power of persuasion, he claims to be a lost scientist investigating the crash site and unfortunately ran into the culprit, Sonic the Hedgehog, who now harnesses powerful Chaos Emeralds to lay waste to the land. Being the gullible guy he is, Knuckles agrees to help Eggman put a stop to this new threat and aid him in his research of the events. Meanwhile, back on West Island, Tails observes a strong energy signal coming from a nearby crash site and quickly informs Sonic. As the two begin to research the event further, Sonic recalls the legend of an island that harnessed raw energy through power stones similar to those of West Island. Sonic and Tails agrees that the two should investigate the nearby crash site to ensure no further issues arise. The two proceed to take flight and lock in on Angel Island via the tornado. As Sonic lays his sights on the shoreline, he transforms into his SS1 state, wielding the seven Chaos Emeralds. As Sonic touches down on the island's soil, Knuckles rises from beneath, ambushing the duo and uppercutting the living shit out of Sonic, causing him to drop the Chaos Emeralds. This man hits Sonic so damn hard, he knocks the super straight out of him. Scooping up the stones foretold by Eggman, Knuckles whisks off, reporting back to Eggman like the good stooge he is, handing over the island stones and solidifying his fate. Sonic, however, wouldn't embark on his adventure empty-handed. He brought a few new skills and upgrades along with him. The biggest quality of life improvement in Sonic 3 comes in the form of the Insta Shield. This technique grants Sonic temporary invulnerability giving his foes a good slashing within range, without having to come in contact with them. It's super satisfying to pull off, especially when badniks are just out of reach and it can break boss encounters completely, especially when Robotnik starts doing his keep away nonsense. We also now have a few new upgrades via the elemental shields which are an absolute gem, granting you some unique techniques to perform throughout. The flame shield grants Sonic invulnerability to fire wielding enemies while also giving you this pretty sick dash attack that lets you soar across the screen like the human torch. 
The Aqua Shield is a huge plus, now eliminating the need to find oxygen while traveling a zone's aquatic setting. This shield also grants you the sweet bounce attack that allows you to slam down on badniks, rebounding upwards to reach higher grounds. This strangely also shields you from various enemies like these cannons in Hydro City that for the life of me, always pick me off the moment I drop down from above. Finally, we have the Thunder Shield that acts as a large magnet when coming in close proximity to rings. It looks pretty sick around Sonic and also grants you a very effective double jump, jolting Sonic upwards when in midair. This personally is by far the most useful shield throughout my Sonic 3 playthrough. Star Pulse also returned to form, granting you some much needed checkpoints throughout your road ahead. However, where Sonic 2 utilizes these nifty pulls to gain access to the Chaos Realm in search of our precious stones, in Sonic 3, they transport you to a bonus stage. Sonic appears inside a giant gumball machine, every 8 year old's fantasy come true. Instead of getting a fresh piece of bubble yum when turning the slots, here we are gifted power shields, spare lives, and extra rings. It's a clever idea, and Sonic will find springs and bumpers along the lining of the machine to keep him airborne long enough to find his favorite flavor. Now, special stages do return, but this time, similarly to Sonic 1 by jumping through those lovely oversized gold rings. Here, they are scattered throughout the zones themselves, not requiring you to collect 50 rings to activate them. It's a great way to promote exploration and takes a great deal of the tension off the player required to hold onto them till the end of the act. In my opinion, this always hindered gameplay. This way just makes the journey that much more engaging. As you materialize into this new three-dimensional plane, you're introduced to the all-new Blue Spheres challenge that finds Sonic navigating across an oversized checkered orb to gather the required number of blue spheres, your dodge and weave through bumpers and red spheres, all while slowly speeding up as time passes. The easiest way I maneuver through this is by gathering blue spheres around the sides of a dedicated set, which will turn the check and remaining spheres into rings. If you manage to locate all blue spheres in the challenge without running into a red sphere, you'll be rewarded with one of the seven Chaos Emeralds. Sonic 3 also has an excellent versus competition, similar to that of Sonic 2. I don't have too many friends today that will sit down and play these, that's typically safe for a Knight of Street Fighter or Tekken, so I don't have too much experience with these, however, what I will tell you is compared to Sonic 2's Versus mode, which rehashes stages from the main story arc, Sonic 3 gives us 5 exclusive zones, they're all quite good and have some unique qualities and assets, and there's a few that stand out to me. First being Chrome Gadget, dropping you into a maze filled with force fields and tricky platforming segments. I also love Endless Mine, which pits you and a buddy against one another in a cleverly designed mine located in an abandoned cave. Each zone in competition loops and our goal is to pass through a post five times. Keep in mind there's a few modes to play, including Grand Prix, Match Race, and Time Attack, so if you have a few hours to kill with a friend, try these out, I don't think they will disappoint. Sonic 3 has some of, if not the largest stages the Classic series has to offer. From the variety of mini bosses to the transitions and cutscenes that fill out the story, there's a lot going on here. So, with that said, we need to dissect these zones one by one, gathering a greater understanding for this event in its entirety, diving further into this newly discovered, now sinking floating island. As this journey begins to unfold, Sonic travels inland from the coastal shores of Angel Island. Right from our iconic opener, the stage is set, and compared to the run of the mill standard green and emerald hill, we now have a whole ass Amazon to travel through. A jungle exponentially larger in size and exploration than ever before. For an opening stage, this setting always gets my blood pumping, ready for whatever comes our way. You can now take the high road, traveling along an intercoastal system of vine work, or take the lower path, traveling across the many waterfalls and vanishing platforms. The deeper you go into these jungles, the more the land becomes roboticized, and before you know it, by Act 2, Eggman will lead an all-out attack on the island's inhabitants, scorching the lands and raising the stakes. It's such a blast discovering various paths decorated in loops and crumbling bridges, and when you think you've reached the axe end, you'll be outrunning Eggman's airship filled with explosives that will lead you further into the heart of the jungle. You eventually get the chance to cool down as you journey below exploring Angel Island's underground waterways through Hydro City. I didn't realize until this playthrough just how many unique paths you can partake in. The more momentum you generate, the easier it is to gain clearance to higher routes, pushing the limits of the underground water slides. The stage itself feels like a giant water park straight out of a child's imagination. This zone pops, decked out in large purple pillars, and a fascinating water temple submerged in an aquatic green and gray aesthetic. The best part for me is having Sonic get grabbed and wound up for an insane water slide. 
Marble Gardens is perhaps the closest thing to uncovering the origins of the floating island. The zone houses the ruins of an ancient civilization. The stage itself is one I really wouldn't fully appreciate until many playthroughs later. This growing up was my least favorite stage and I think it's due to the many hazards that will straight up blindside you the moment you begin following the already confusing road signs ahead. But as I've continued to dive deeper into the lore of Sonic 3, the rich architecture throughout is what I really appreciate here. I always disliked running across those awkward blue spinner tops. Often they would appear to have a mind of their own. The vast amount of spike balls and roulettes of traps would exhaust me by the end of Act 2, but nowadays it's probably my favorite act from the stone statues that double as temple guards to the battle with Eggman that has you take to the skies and actually do some unique tag team moves incorporating in Tails. This type of boss fight we need more of. Reaching safer grounds, you're land in one of Angel Island's grand attractions, Carnival Night Zone, a non-stop all-night fever dream filled with bright lights and even brighter sights. You can take to the tilting cannons and launch across the many stage props, whether that be an area filled with rotating pillars to get wrapped up in, or a play area with many balloons for popping to travel across its brilliantly chaotic design. Giant rotating discs will make anyone vomit at a local fair, but here, it's something you will need to get used to in order to travel about. In a nutshell, this is Sonic 3's Casino Night Zone with its many gadgets and wacky pinball bumpers that bounce you to and from the various challenges. As the night draws to a close, the temperature drops drops as the snow begins to fall, covering the mountains of Angel Island in a winter wonderland. Dropping down into the stage for the very first time hits you in all the right places. This was that iconic moment in Sonic 3 where shit got really good. The snowboarding sequence across the snowy ice caps hit so hard, a stage with multiple paths to navigate the icy loops and weathered slopes. Catapulting yourself to higher peaks is ideal and solving tiny riddles deep inside the ice caverns is a testament to the team's craft. It's such a brilliant time and everything really really falls together perfectly as you make your way to the final chapter. After warming up, the duo of Sonic and Tails will eventually reach Eggman's launch base where Eggman plans to rehabilitate the Death Egg, a well-constructed, fortified structure built with the greatest Eggman defensive tech Emeralds have to offer. Eggman will stop at nothing in order to get his beloved Death Egg up and running once more. Launch base is covered in winding pipes that apparently are used for transporting water to and from as a primary source of power. There's some excellent speed traps that will launch you all over the base. Mix that with some extreme zip lining and ridiculous high speed loops and you got one hell of a good time on your hands. The only issue though is this place is filled with boss fights. The mid-level boss is a complete pushover but can throw you off your game at times with its awkward rotation. Yet systematically, wreaking havoc on Eggman's base by Act 2 is very satisfying. You eventually encounter Eggman three times by the end of the zone. As Eggman prepares for liftoff, Sonic will slow him down just enough as Eggman attempts to prevent Sonic from ransacking his ship. Sonic plans to find a seat on board and makes quick work of Eggman, hijacking his egg mobile as a result. Knuckles attempts to take one more shot at Sonic but fails miserably, losing his balance as the base begins to shake. Sonic arrives at the launch site, locking in on our hardboiled boss man in an all-out showdown, coming face to face with his egg rocket. This first round is a complete breeze and Eggman will raise and lower from the right and left sides, scheming all the way from inside his rocket. This rocket is made of three sections with the top housing Eggman and a tiny orbiting spike sphere protecting the top that can be more problematic than needs be. The remaining two sections rotate about, shooting lasers at Sonic, just hammer away, dodging his projectiles, and he will go up in smokes faster than his previous plans. Eggman will retreat and the sun will set, capturing the moment perfectly. Eggman returns, rocking his heavy-handed big arm. This straight diesel construction is no joke. It'll body slam the living shit out of you if caught. The main strat here is bobbing and weaving as he attempts to grab you. Dodging his spikes as he flies below like a great white. Give him the business quickly and he will go down for the count, with Eggman retreating as the death egg vanishes in an instant as his egg station crumbles apart down into Angel Island. As with our previous outing, throughout the franchise, solidifying a good ending comes down to collecting the mystical stones of each adventure. In the event you don't succeed in collecting them, you are greeted to a trollish scene of Eggman and Knuckles laughing at our blue boy, juggling the uncollected Chaos Emeralds. However, if we do succeed on our journey, we will close out our story with an epic scene depicting Sonic and Tail guest posing in front of the Sonic 3 logo.
Sonic 3 brings the total package to the table. The stage delivers that high speed, high intensity I get from Sonic 2 while additionally doing so much more. There's a great deal of substance here, and there's so many moving parts spread throughout they begin to snowball the further you play through. Each stage is executed and designed flawlessly, and each time I give this an additional go, whether that be Sonic or Tails, I'm shocked by the amount of new discovery. Although Knuckles was a great adversary to say the least, in the back of my mind I can't help but feel as if Sega dropped the ball here by not fleshing out his character arc a bit more. I would have loved to have the option to potentially play throughout this as Knuckles. I could totally see the Sonic team fleshing out a brand new character with unique abilities, similar to how Tails has flight but further expanded on through a killer skill set that alters gameplay. Perhaps his techniques could reveal some additional branching pathways only Knuckles would be familiar with as the guardian of this Angel Island. The artistic direction of the various zone themes flows so well, each act gives you a progressive narrative from remixed audio tracks to a wide range of fun cutscenes and sounds that makes the experience that much more immersive. Even jumping into the sound test options, you can't help but blast some of these tunes. I could sit here and have a whole ass session jamming out. I can't help but wonder though, Mushroom Hill? Sandopolis? What exactly are these? They're not zones, I mean, I did finish the game as Supersonic capturing the 7 Chaos Emeralds. I witnessed the Death Egg go up in smoke and... Wait, what? Lock on? Lock on what? There's no way. You mean to tell me there's a whole nother, 